everybody? You, you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, this is Saving My Car by Hacking It, Tale of Joy and Woe. Uh, as you've no doubt gathered from that title, this talk is different from the other talks, a lot of the other talks here today. Uh, most talks are by experts in their field discussing or debating a topic, a topic in the industry, where we're going and why, that kind of thing. This talk, though, is about a guy stumbling around and trying to fix something he most certainly does not understand. So uh, there are two goals of this talk. Uh, one is to entertain you with the insane effort that went into fixing my car, and the other is to hopefully motivate or inspire you to go to, to, go to insane lengths to accomplish something, because in my experience, you know, the, the crazier it is and the crazier people tell you that you are to attempt it, the better off you'll be if you just go ahead and do it. So. Um, let me just ask, show of hands, how many people in here know anything at all about car hacking? Darn. Because <laughs> you probably know more than me. Because <laughs> uh, I knew absolutely nothing when I started this. So I apologize in advance if I say anything stupid. Uh, it was me stumbling around to see what I could figure out. Uh, so by the end of this talk, you might say, I you might be able to argue I still don't know anything, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'd never seen a talk in car hacking before, never done any reading on it, nothing. Just about, a, just about me in over my head starting to try to hack this thing at square one, from square one. So let's uh, get a little away. Uh, do not hack your car, at least not the car that you actually drive. I mean, I cannot stress that enough. I mean, you have to keep in mind here that we are potentially messing with the code that decides whether the car is going to respond to your turning the steering wheel or applying the brakes or pressing on the gas pedal. I mean, you, if you flip the wrong bit in the firmware, then uh, suddenly you find you have flipped, you know, in your car and are now in a ditch. So don't be crazy, please be careful. So having said that, let's move on. Uh, meet the manual transmission 1997 Chevrolet Cavalier. <laughs> nice. This guy has been a part of my life for the better part of 315,000 miles. <laughs> and it's all in the original clutch, believe it or not. Uh, but one day I got in to take off, or I got in to take off somewhere, and it just would not start. Now, uh, let me just say, when it comes to cars, I know basically nothing. <laughs> I, I know how to start a car, but no, that I, that's a random picture I got off the internet that is not actually in my car, but it is I, it is a '97 Cavalier. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so. I know how to start a car, I know how to drive a car, I know how to put gas in a car, I can put oil in a car, but am I an expert on repairing cars? Not at all, not in the slightest. So before I could even begin to understand why the car wouldn't start, I had to do a lot of reading to understand the basics on how the car runs, because every car is different. So here's what I came up with on an overview of the basic components of this, of this car. In the steering column, uh, behind the steering wheel, you have two components physically locked into each other. The ignition lock cylinder, which is the green box, and the uh, ignition switch, which is the blue box. And uh, so the first thing that happens is you put your key in the ignition lock cylinder, and then when you turn the key, you're physically rotating uh, the key inside the ignition lock cylinder, which is also locked into the ignition switch. So when you turn the key, you're also turning that ignition switch. And the ignition switch has a, a sort of kill switch, which is the clutch safety switch, that, that red box in the picture. And assuming the clutch pedal is depressed, which activates the clutch safety switch, the turning of the ignition switch supplies power from the battery to everywhere it needs to go for the car to actually start, which is why you have to have the clutch pressed in on a manual transmission for to start. So uh, the engine turning over is not the end of the story. There's, there's still the anti-theft system to deal with. And on this car, it's, it's something called the pass lock security system. And essentially, if the engine is running, but the computer can't detect that the car was started legitimately with the original key, then it disables the fuel injectors, which causes the car to die. And since the ignition switch physically turning and supplying battery power to the right places is what makes the car start, all you have to do is detach that ignition switch, stick a screwdriver in there, and physically turn it the same way you turn the key, and it'll fire right up. That's a good way to steal a car, by the way, if you, if you know it doesn't have a security system. But uh, so the pass lock system needs to prevent that from working somehow. And the way it does that is it starts with the ignition lock cylinder, which is the green box. and uh, Inside there is a resistor of a certain resistance, which is different from car to car. And that resistance is known by the instrument panel cluster, which is the yellow box. Um, and when you physically turn the cylinder, it applies that certain resistance to a wire connected to the instrument panel cluster. Uh, 
So when you turn the key, a signal is sent to that instrument panel cluster, and then it knows whether that resistance is correct. And if, and only if, the resistance is correct, it sends a password, whatever that is, uh, over to the PCM, also known as the power train control module, or the, the main computer. And if the engine has started, but the PCM hasn't received that password from the instrument panel cluster, then it makes the decision to disable the fuel injectors, and then illuminate the check engine and security lights on the, on the cluster. With, and then it sets a trouble code that indicates the security system disabled the car. So an awful lot of stuff has to be working correctly in order for the PCM to have what it needs to not disable the fuel injectors. So the, you know, you've got the ignition lock cylinder, the instrument panel, and the wiring that connects all those to each other. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Not that I'm aware of. Well, there is actually a relearn procedure that you can do, that, and that relearn procedure is what tells the instrument cluster to start paying attention to that new resistance. So you, can, you actually can, and I'll get into that, you can actually bypass it by just putting any, any resistor in there. Yeah, you, you scare me because you know a lot more than I do. <laughs> uh, but so you got the ignition lock cylinder, the instrument panel, and the wiring that connects those to each other, and the PCM all has to be correct or the car can't start. Uh, so what's wrong with my car? Uh, well, the engine does turn over, and then a second later it dies, and the security warning light on the instrument panel cluster lights up. So something in this whole chain of the pass lock system is not functioning as it should. So naturally, let's start replacing parts and see what happens. Uh, the first thing I thought was that the ignition lock cylinder might be bad, so I looked up various guides online about how to bypass the pass lock system, and people do that by putting their own resistor on that instrument panel cluster or the wire that leads to it, and then they trigger that relearn procedure so that it'll accept that new resistor value, which is how old remote start kits work. Uh, and by the way, that relearn procedure takes 30 minutes, so that's intentional so that if you're trying to steal the car, you've got to wait 30 minutes before you can actually steal it, so that's why they do that. Um, so I, bought, I, 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 I did that, it didn't help. So then I decided to buy a, a brand new ignition lock cylinder, put that in, that still didn't help. So then I thought maybe the ignition switch is bad, which is kind of a long shot, but I tried to put one in, that also didn't help. And then I thought maybe the clutch safety switch had gone bad, so I checked with the multimeter to uh, make sure the clutch pedal was properly making that switch connection, which it was, so it wasn't that. Uh, if you look under, behind the, uh, the uh, clutch pedal, you can see a switch in there and there are wires that come out of it, so just check to make sure it's good, and, and all the way up to the ignition switch. So. Uh, so then I thought maybe the computer had somehow gone bad, and uh, maybe the pins on it had corroded or something, I mean, who knows, it, it, the, anything could be causing it to not send that password from the instrument cluster to the computer. So, but there is a problem with replacing that component, and that is that your VIN number, or your vehicle identification number, which is unique to your, your car, is stored in the PCM. And not only that, but the, the password that flies around between the instrument cluster and the PCM is generated from the VIN number. So the PCM and the instrument panel cluster are kind of married to each other. You know, if you replace, if you, so if you replace one of them, it needs to have the matching VIN number in it or you'll cause exactly this problem. <laughs> so um, fortunately, you can buy replacement PCMs on eBay and the seller will actually pre-flash it for you with the VIN number that you specify. So I did that. <laughs> I bought one off eBay, slapped it in the car, and it still didn't work. So. Just to recap, I, I've replaced the ignition lock cylinder, I've replaced the ignition switch, I've replaced the computer itself, and still nothing. So that just leaves the instrument panel cluster, which is prohibitively expensive to get a new one with the right VIN number in it. I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> this is not practical. Don't like, like I said, don't do this. So this is just. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, so. Uh, so it's either the instrument panel cluster, which is way too expensive to replace, or it's the wiring that connects all these components together. Now there are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of wires connecting all this stuff together, and uh, usually when there's a loose connection somewhere, people just give up and junk the whole car. It's, th these bad connections are almost impossible to track down. And uh, even worse, I have no idea how to do that. So uh, I returned all those replacement parts that I bought, so I didn't actually spend any money at that point, except for the PCM from eBay, and uh, tried to think about what to do next. So. Uh, at this point, I have a spare PCM that only works with my car's VIN number, and I know that the PCM disables the fuel injectors whenever it detects an unauthorized engine start, meaning it didn't get that password from the instrument panel cluster. Uh, 
And I also know that the PCM contains firmware that implements this detection, and I know that dealerships upgrade this firmware all the time. So if that's the case, what's to stop us from modifying the firmware and removing that check? Well, that's when I started reading about a community uh, of people uh, called the uh, tuners uh, that, uh, who modify the, the firmware in their car's computers to, uh, to tweak engine performance and other stuff, just get the, generally get the most out of their cars. Uh, they also actually disable the security system in the firmware so that they can take the engine and the computer and transplant it into the body of another car and it'll keep working, which is exactly what I want to do. I want to disable that feature entirely so that the computer doesn't care what's going on outside of it as long as the engine turns over and runs. So there you go, sounds like a project. All I want to do is just do what they do. And so if they can do it, so can I. So the next question I have to ask myself is how do other people disable this check? Well, according to the internet, uh, people tune their cars by loading up the firmware image in an application called, oddly enough, Tuner Pro, a free application. Then they load what's called an XDF file or a definition file, which defines the memory addresses for configuration flags for all sorts of things, including, of course, the enabling, disabling of that anti-theft functionality. So then all they have to do is tell Tuner Pro, hey, turn this off, and it knows which bits or bytes to change from that XDF file. And then it saves the firmware image back out, and then tuners just write that firmware image back to the car. Sounds easy, right? Well, it depends on the kind of car you have. <clears throat> Most uh, tuners and car dealerships will update the firmware through the OBD2 diagnostic port under the steering column, which is on every car manufactured after 1996, which is good for us, because we have 97 that we're trying to deal with. Unfortunately, though, each car manufacturer uses different protocols and different tools to actually connect to and use that diagnostic port. For example, General Motors, which is what we have to deal with for our car, has a specific device called a Tech 2 scan tool, which is kind of like a fancy code reader, that you plug into the OBD2 port, which, you know, of course, it's capable of more than just reading uh, diagnostic codes, though. It can, it can upload and download firmware in the PCM. There's one problem with this thing, though, and that is that it is ridiculously expensive. <laughs> This thing runs anywhere from a few hundred, if you want the cheap Chinese clone, to several thousands of dollars, which, you know, is fine. <laughs> maybe the protocol that it uses is documented somewhere online, so maybe we can just implement it ourselves with something else. So I do some Googling, and no, no, that's not the case. <laughs> In fact, it uses some sort of uh, proprietary, obfuscated algorithm, so you've got to have to unlock the PCM before you can read from or write to it. Uh, it GM really doesn't want you doing yourself what this thing does, unfortunately. So. Even worse, it seems there's no XDF file for our particular car, so we're gonna have to find these memory addresses ourselves. So now what do we do? Uh, well, first things first, we need to get at the firmware. And if we can't simply plug in and read or write the firmware, we're gonna have to get physical. So if I unplug and remove the PCM from the car and unscrew the top cover, this is what I see. Now I'm not a hardware guy, so I can only make uneducated guesses as to what's going on inside this thing, but uh, one thing I do know is that at the bottom are the connectors for attaching the PCM to the car. On the left and right sides appear to be some kind of heat sinks or something. And then in the middle is a whole mess of chips and circuitry. And the uh, square chip, just to the left of center near the top, looks to be the most complicated one because it's got the most pins. And I, I'd be willing to bet more than likely that that is probably the main processor of this thing. So you know, I've taken apart enough things to know that's probably what it is. It's probably the brain of this whole thing. And the majority of these smaller chips probably serve some specific purpose, something that the main processor wouldn't have time to do itself, like handle the communication over the OBD2 diagnostic port. So the big question here is, where is the firmware stored? Uh, based on what little information I can gather, it's probably stored in one of two places. It, one, either one, it's stored inside that square custom chip, which means we're screwed because we'll never figure out what it does or what all those pins do, or it's stored in a separate standard memory chip. So what did we do? We start Googling every number we find printed on, this, on, this, on every chip on this board. And when we, we do, one in particular stands out, which is that rectangular, you probably already know, that rectangular chip up at the top, which is a flash memory chip capable of holding 512 kilobytes of data. And for an embedded device like this, that's a fairly significant chunk of memory, more than enough to hold the code that controls this thing, so it's, it's fairly safe to say this is probably the thing that we want. So now that we've identified the memory chip we want to dump, how do we dump it? Well, even though I'm not a hardware guy, I have physically extracted chips like this before, so I happen to already have an old Willem EEPROM programmer this picture here, which is capable of reading from and writing to all sorts of memory chips through adapters that you plug into that big green rectangular connector. But, of course, I don't have the adapter for this particular 44-pin chip, so I had to wait for one to get here from China through eBay. But after six to eight weeks later, eventually once it did get here, I had everything I needed to physically desolder the chip and drop it into this nice little adapter, plug the adapter into the programmer, hook it up to an old piece of crap PC that still has a parallel for it, which this thing uses, and dump it, right? 
Well, uh, the problem is this adapter sucks. <laughs> the whole programmer sucks, to be honest. It, it's something right out of the late 90s, which I realize the irony of that statement because I'm trying to fix a car from the late 90s, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the reason the adapter sucks is that the uh, zero insertion force socket isn't capable of making good contact with all the pins on the sides of the chip. And because of that, I just can't get a good, reliable, consistent dump of the chip. So I have no choice but to remove the zero insertion force socket and re-solder the flash chip right onto the adapter like I did in that picture there. Once I did this, though, I was able to consistently dump the entire 512 kilobytes of that chip. So, yay. <laughs> uh, thankfully, Google has come to the rescue and presented me with a, a series of forum posts that tell me how to interpret this firmware dump. These seven or eight year old posts were pretty much the only, only help I could find on the subject, so I had to decipher this one guy's notes and just do the best I could. Apparently, the processor in this PCM and others of its era is a, a Motorola, it's called a Motorola 68332, which uses the CPU32 instruction set. And here's where I've lucked out, because, because I, I just so happen to have a history with the Motorola 68K series CPUs. Ever since high school, as you know, Jarvis mentioned, I've messed with basic and assembly programming for Texas Instruments graphing calculators, some of which have a Motorola 68K CPU. And I enjoy collecting and tinkering with old game consoles, which is good because the Sega Genesis just so happens to have Motorola 60K CPU. And like you said, I, I did that Pure Solar talk a couple years ago about dumping that ROM, so I am no stranger to this processor, or so I think. <laughs> we'll find out. So anyway, it sure would be nice to be able to confirm in some way if this file really was dumped correctly, and this really is Motorola 68K firmware being executed by this PCM. And so, well, one thing I do know about the Motorola 68K is that there should be a vector table at the beginning of memory. And what is a vector table? It's a, it's a table of addresses that the Motorola 68K CPU uses in response to certain events. For example, when the CPU first gets power, it has to start executing from somewhere, right? So it figures out where to do that by looking at memory address four, which holds what is called the reset vector because that's where the address to start executing code from on reset is stored. So if I look at that address, what I see is 00040.04. Okay, so if I fire up a disassembler 98 Pro and look at address 4004 and hit C to start analyzing code there, I get total garbage, which is strange. Not sure what to do about that, so we start looking for human readable strings. So I do a quick scan, and I find just a couple of strings. And one of them appeared to be a 17-character VIN number, except it's not a VIN number. The actual VIN number, and this is just an example. This isn't really my real VIN number. It looks like what's on the slide there. So I stared at this for a minute until I realized that if you swap every two characters or bytes in the actual VIN number, you see the resulting string in the file. So it turns out that the file is a little jumbled up. Uh, and it, I found out later that this is called byte swaps because every two bytes are actually swiped. That's how they're actually physically stored on the chip, but that's not what we want. We want to see how it's actually being executed by the processor. So we whip up a little script to swap every two bytes in the file and write it back out, and now we have the file we really want. So if we go back to looking at, at address four, we don't see 4004, we see 0440. So if we go there in IDA Pro and start analyzing, we see an explosion of readable code. In fact, we see a beautiful graph of how cleanly this file is assembled. It's almost scary how clean it is, which is a rare thing. So uh, that's great. <laughs> we have a complete firmware dump that disassembles cleanly in IDA Pro. Now what do we do? Uh, at this point, this all just appears as 512 kilobytes of pure nonsense, because it would take years to properly and truly understand all this code. So let's remember our goal, which is to disable the check on whether we've received the password or not from the instrument panel cluster. The problem is we have absolutely no idea where in the firmware that check is. And there doesn't seem to exist, an X, as I mentioned, there doesn't seem to be exist an XDF file for our 97 Cavalier. But, and this is the key, maybe one does exist for a similar car. So if we know the memory address we want to change in somebody else's firmware image, maybe that'll give us clues to finding the memory address in our own image. So after doing lots and lots and lots and lots of Googling, the closest firmware image I could find, which had a matching XDF file, was the 2001 Pontiac Trans Am. So uh, if you load up this firmware image 98 Pro, along with the corresponding XDF file, we hopefully can get it to tell us what controls this anti-theft feature. And when I do, I notice a particular setting called Option Byte for the Vehicle Theft Deterrent, which sounds promising, and it gives me the memory address of 1E5CC. So if I fire up IDA Pro and go against that 2001 Pontiac Trans Am image and go to that memory address, it puts me in the middle of a bunch of bytes that are referenced all over the place in the code. It turns out that this area is some sort of configuration area which controls all the features of the car's computer. All the flags, all the things that control what the firmware is gonna do are all stored in there. 
So if I were to change that byte in Tuner Pro and save the program image, it'll update two things. One, it'll update that option byte at 1E5CC, and it'll also update a checksum word or two bytes that protects the configuration area from corruption or tampering. So to turn off the anytheft system, all we have to do is flip a bit, update the checksums, write those changes back to the car, and voila, we're done. It's, it sounds simple. So all we have to do is find the same code that uses that byte. Uh, I, it didn't, my transitions didn't work. I was going to show one smiley face at a time, or frowny face at a time, but I won't. Um, so all we have to do is find the same code that uses that byte from the 2001 Pontiac Trans Am image in our own 97 Cavalier firmware image. So uh, the code being displayed here is just one of several places where the any theft flag is used according to IDA Pro. But this code in particular, in particular is the only time where there's a small subroutine that looks at the value of that flag and then returns it to something else. And this, this subroutine gets called oh, all over the place, way too many places to track down, but that just tells us that it's an important flag. So theoretically now, all we have to do is find similar looking code to this in our own firmware image and we'll know what's changed. So we simply look in our own firmware for these exact instructions, except the references to that memory address, that F, FF, uh, B8, E5, I think, and see if we can find it. And did we find it? No. <laughs> so, of course, that's a really simplistic check, so let's try to be a little bit smarter. Let's look for any comparison to bit two of a particular byte anywhere in it. Did we find it? No, of course not. So, if we look for the just those SNE and NEG instructions against register D0, and then and any time where that's happening and being handed with something else, do we find it? No. So, let's look for those instructions next to each other anywhere in the firmware image, do we find it? No. <laughs> so there are plenty, obviously there are plenty of reasons why the code would be a little different. You've got compiler optimizations and all kinds of things. That, that's fine. We'll just have to get a little more creative. I thought it would be really simple to simply look for the same or similar code pattern in our own firmware image and we'd have no trouble finding it, but apparently not. So that begs the question, these Tuner Pro XDF definition files have to get created by somebody, right? So how do they find all these memory addresses that they're interested in so they can build these XDF files? Well, according to the forum post I found, they look for a particular piece of functionality in the firmware. And this functionality they look for is the code that handles all the scan tool requests. And the scan tool is just another name for an OBD2 code reader, which is the device you plug into the, the port under your steering wheel and read diagnostic codes whenever your check engine lights on. Uh, so the uh, the computer here, the PCM here, it's what's responsible for receiving the commands from that code reader device, and it generates a response and then sends it back over the OBD2 OBD port to your code reader tool. So that means that somewhere in this 512 kilobyte mess is all the code that handles all these requests. And more importantly, these tools are capable of, you know, as I said, receiving more than just those codes. They can upload and download firmware, but they can also retrieve all sorts of real-time engine information telling you exactly what the computer's doing and how well it's doing it. And most importantly, it also can return the anti-theft system status. And in order for it to do that, it has to look at our option flag to determine whether it's even enabled. So that means if we can understand this OBD2 communication code, we can find our way to the option flag in the 2001 Pontiac Trans Am firmware. And if we can navigate our way to the flag from there, then we can just apply that same logic to our firmware and find it that way. <coughs> so how do we find the code that handles these requests? Uh, well, if we consult our PCM Hacking 101 guide, uh, we start by looking for the code that actually interacts with the OBD2 port. So how does a Motorola 68K CPU interact with, uh, the, the, with that OBD2 port or any hardware? Um, it uses something called memory mapped I.O., which is, that basically means that, that the hardware is wired in such a way that when you read from or write to a particular memory address, you aren't accessing bytes in the firmware on the flash chip or in RAM, you're manipulating actual hardware. So now in any given device, there is usually a range of address space dedicated just to interacting with hardware. Not always, but usually. And we know it has to be outside the range of where the firmware exists, and we know it has to be outside the range of where the RAM exists. Now we know how big the firmware is, and since we disassembled so cleanly, we know it starts out at address zero, because that's where we started disassembling it. So that means the firmware goes from address zero all the way up to seven FFFF. And we also know from poking around in the disassembly that the RAM starts at FF000, but we don't know how big it is or we don't know where it ends. Now, this is kind of nutty, but I was in a hurry, so basically what you can do is just use IDA Pro to export a .asm file, which contains all the, all the code for it, all the instructions decoded, and then use regular expressions to rip out the memory addresses accessed by certain instructions, and then just sort that list of memory addresses, which will tell us 
every memory address that gets accessed in this firmware. Not, maybe not everything, but the vast majority of it. So when we do that, we discover that RAM access, accesses only go up to a certain point, and then things start getting weird. So we start, if we start looking at memory, at the, at the values of the memory addresses uh, beyond that, uh, we start seeing loops on the value contained at those certain memory addresses, which, you know, it wouldn't make sense to keep reading the same area over and over in a loop unless, expecting something to change, unless that address represents a piece of hardware that can change externally. So when you see code like that, you know you're dealing with memory mapped I.O. So we don't have a complete memory map just yet, but we know where the hardware accesses are likely to be. So consulting our forum guide, again, we learned that one of these chips on the PCM circuit board is responsible for handling all the OBD2 port communication. And by that, I don't mean it generates the requests or the responses, I mean it deals with the, the work of interpreting the raw signals from the OBD2 port's pins and translating that into a series of bytes going back and forth between the firmware and whatever device you have plugged into the OBD2 port. So all it does is tell the firmware, hey, something sent five bytes to us, here they are, just tell me what you want me to send back and the firmware deals with the logic of actually figuring out what those bytes will be. And this chip has a name, it's called the MC68HC58 Data Link Controller, and lucky for us, there is documentation out there on the internet for us to look at about this chip. It's fairly comprehensive documentation about anything and everything you ever wanted to know about how to interact with this controller. And it even tells us the hardware registers, meaning the memory mapped I.O. that the firmware uses to communicate with it tells us everything but the actual number, the actual memory address that the firmware is using to interact with it, which is gonna be up to us to figure out. So after printing out that documentation for the chip and some sleepless nights reading it, I figured out that some bytes in the firmware must be writing to certain registers, otherwise the chip can't work, because the chip has to be initialized by writing certain values to it, so that has to exist somewhere in the firmware. So I started hunting down where these writes were in the firmware, and sure enough, I found them, starting at address FFF600. So that is the start of the range that you can read from and write to to manipulate the, that uh, data link controller chip. So now that we've found the code that receives a command, well, all we have to do is look for references to that address, by the way, and we'll find code that deals with it. So now that we've found the code that receives a command from an OBD2 code reader, it should be really easy to read the disassembly and get from there to the code that accesses our option flag. Well, no. <laughs> According to our forum guide, apparently it isn't that simple. <clears throat> the firmware actually buffers these requests in RAM and then it dequeues them from that buffer later on when it's able to get to it. And then after it's acted on that request and calculated a response for it, it buffers that for whenever the firmware is able to get around to sending it back to the device that's plugged into the OBD2 port. So basically you have something of a, a kind of a multi-threaded environment going on here, for lack of a better term, <clears throat> which makes perfect sense. I mean, the computer has to focus on keeping the engine running smoothly. It can't get tied up with requests on how well the engine is performing. It's got to focus on the engine. So it makes sense, but that makes it a freaking nightmare to try and disassemble. You just can't. I mean, the forum guide does its best to explain it, but unfortunately, its information doesn't apply 100% to our firmware, and it's just too difficult to extrapolate what we need in order to find it. So it's just too darn complicated to disassemble and get anywhere, so we're just screwed, right? <coughs> well, here's where it starts getting really nutty. <laughs> if you, by the way, if you read the abstract for this talk, there's a, re there's a reference to descending into madness Welcome to the madness. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if we can't read the disassembly of the code and understand it, then our only option is to execute and debug it. So how in the world do we do that? Well, apparently there are, are people out there that actually do this. They, they pull the PCM out of the car and put it on a workbench and attach a bunch of equipment to it and debug the code in real time to see what it's doing. But I have absolutely no clue how to do that. <laughs> I mean, we don't have the pinouts for the PCM, so even if we did know what we were doing, we wouldn't know how to interface with this specific PCM. So we don't know anything about the hardware, we don't know anything about the software, all we know is the CPU it's running and the basics of a, a memory map for it. Well, that's one thing we do have going for it. It, it is at least an extremely similar, uh, it's, it's a CPU extremely similar to others, other well-known ones, which is guaranteed to have dozens of emulators out there for it, for the Sega Genesis and other things. So all we need the firmware to do is just is boot just well enough that we can send these scan tool requests to it and see what code gets executed when we do that. It doesn't actually have to keep an engine running. We just need to see how to get from point A, which is the data link controller code, to point B, which is the memory access of that option flag. So this is an absolutely insane idea, which is, of course, why we're gonna do it. So if we're going to seriously consider this, we have to think about what language we're gonna do this in. Now I think, live, breathe, and dream C-sharp for my day job, so that is firmly ingrained into my brain. So if we're really gonna do this, I'm gonna have to hack the crap out of an existing emulator. 
I need to be able to gut hardware access code and be able to add it right back and, and then gut it again and add it back with great efficiency. I need, to, I need to be able to do it quickly. So what I want to do is find a Motorola 68K emulator in C Sharp. And you'd think that wouldn't exist, but believe it or not, thank goodness, it actually does. <laughs> There is uh, actually an old uh, Capcom arcade system called the CPS-1, or Capcom Play System 1. I don't know if you've heard of that. I, I hadn't had to Google it. Uh, and if you, so if, you, if you've ever played Street Fighter 2 in an arcade, you may very well have, been, have played this thing or have used it. Somebody actually went to the trouble and created a, a, an, an emulator in C-sharp for this thing with a full-featured debugger, and it could totally play the games with smooth video and sound, and you can get it right now on Code Project, but there's like... Uh, we, we really lucked out because this thing not only emulates the Motorola 68K CPU, but it also emulates the Z-Log or Zilog Z80 CPU because it used that as a sound processor. So all we have to do is hack the crap out of this emulator, totally gut all the video related code and display hardware, all the timers and other stuff unique to the CPS-1 and just trash it. So I, <clears throat> I spent a not insignificant amount of time <laughs> refactoring this application. So it was just a, so it was ju it was just a Motorola 68K CPU core and with the ability to extend it with details about our PCM hardware. So now that I have this Motorola 68K emulator in C-sharp, it's time to get it to boot the 2001 Pontiac Trans Am image, for lack of boot, for lack of a better word. So uh, I fire it up, and I find that it immediately encounters an illegal instruction. Can't say I'm very surprised. We're, we're, it's insane that we're even trying this, but let's take a look at what's at that memory address in IDA Pro and see what's going on. And when I look at that address, <clears throat> I saw something I didn't expect to see. I see a TBL U instruction. Now, what in the world is that? I have no idea. Never seen it before. Never seen it in any Sega Genesis disassembly that I've ever dealt with. But uh, IDA Pro knew how to display it to me, so that tells me it's not actually an illegal instruction. Somebody somewhere knows what this is. So <clears throat> I go hunt down the Motorola 68332 user manual and look up the TBL U instruction. Now, I won't get into the weeds on this, but basically this instruction performs a table lookup and calculates a value based on how precisely, how precisely how far into the table you go, utilizing both whole and fractional components. It's, it's kind of nutty that an instruction like that exists. But, so why in the world would a CPU need an instruction that does this? <clears throat> well, it's actually really useful in exactly this type of automotive application because it lets the PCM store complex tables of engine information and it can quickly derive a precise value when communicating with various pieces of hardware. So you don't have to store massive tables, you can just store approximations of the data and it can figure it out from there. <clears throat> it's all very fascinating, but we don't care. We just want the emulator to not crash. So we put a halfway decent implementation of that instruction into the C-sharp emulator based on my poor understanding of what it does and just move on, which was painful, but getting into the weeds on Motorola 68K instruction decoding enabled me to fix all sorts of bugs that were in the CPS-1 emulator, that, which weren't a problem for the games it was emulating, but it was a big problem for me. So <clears throat> even though I wasn't starting from scratch, there's still a lot of uh, op, you know, op codes and instruction decoding and stuff that I had to figure out. So now that we're past the instructions that the emulator didn't yet have support for, well, now we're on to the, the next, we're on to the next problem. Um, the emulator's running, no crashes or anything, but now it's stuck in an infinite loop. And hopefully, hopefully you can see that. But uh, it basically keeps testing bit seven, the memory address FFFC1F, over and over and over, and it keeps on doing this until that bit is set. And the problem is that bit's never set because our, we're emulating RAM and at that address, and we're just assuming that it's zero because we don't know what else to put there. So the bits are reset, and it, when it goes to access it, 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 it's checking to see if it's set. It's obviously never set, so it gets stuck in an infinite loop. And normally this code would make no sense since there doesn't appear to be anything that would make that value change. But since FFFC1F is within the range that we think is memory mapped IO, this probably represents some hardware register. What this code does, I have no idea. Why, why are we waiting on bit seven here? I have no idea. But now that we have an emulator where we control every aspect of what it's doing, we don't have to care one bit. Pun intended there. <laughs> so. We, we fix this by tweaking the emulator to always say the bits are set when this memory address is accessed, and then we just happily move on. Well, to be accurate, we do this a few dozen more times <laughs> with other addresses, and then we happily move on. So now we've finally gotten to the point that the firmware has entered its main, what we believe is its main loop, and we're ready to begin adding code that emulates the behavior of the data link controller chip. Since we now know what memory addresses represent the hardware registers of the data link controller, we simply add code that pretends there is no scan tool request to receive until we start clicking buttons on our own to simulate a request. 
So we have your, our emulator all set up so we can just type in the bytes that make up a scan tool request, hit a button, and it'll prepare it for the firmware to receive it and then act on it and generate a response and send it back to us. So I click the button to do that and <clears throat> nothing happens. <laughs> so we have another problem to solve. I, I scratched my head on this one for a long time, but then I finally remembered something from that PCM Hacking 101 guide. It says the routines that handle OBD messages or scan tool requests are executed by main scheduling routines. And I thought schedule was kind of a funny word to use here, so I started thinking, if the processing of messages is on a schedule, then that implies some sort of hardware timer, a crystal timer to be exact. <clears throat> and that means the firmware must be keeping track of the number of accurate ticks that pass over time. And the only time Motorola 68K code can be notified of something is if it's being interrupted. And so we know that's done through the vector table. So if we check the vector table where the handlers for all interrupts are defined, we find a routine that looks very suspicious. This routine, whenever a specific interrupt fires, will set a flag to one and then it increments a counter, a very large counter by one. And as it turns out, this counter is checked within the main loop. So this is actually the number of ticks since the firmware is booted. And the scan tool request handling routines only fire when a certain number of ticks have occurred. So all we have to do is just simulate the triggering of this interrupt periodically, say every few milliseconds, and it'll work the way it's supposed to. We don't know or care what the real number of milliseconds is, we just need it to be kind of close. So when we do this, we find that the firmware suddenly starts sending our simulated data link controller responses back to us. So now, finally, we have an emulator for this car computer and we can simulate scan tool requests by sending them to it and get the responses back from them. So now that we've finally gotten to that point, we uh, just simply write some code to brute force through all the possible scan tool requests and then just set a breakpoint on the code that accesses our option flag. <clears throat> so the emulator just sits there and spins its wheels forever until it gets to the point where it's gonna access the flag that we know controls the anti-theft the anti -theft status and then we'll know what we're supposed to be sending to it in order to get to that. So many hours or days later, <laughs> we have it. So now that we have an actual request to look at, we can do some Googling and see what this is. And this is known as mode 22, which is where GM stuffs their non-standard scan tool request. Stuff that, this is stuff that changes potentially over time and across models, even within GM. So uh, request 1102 seems to return our option flag among other things. So now that we've found the scan tool request in the 2001 Pontiac Trans Am image, we can execute our own firmware image and send the same request to it. So once we see where the code takes us, we find the memory address of the option flag for our 97 Cavalier image, modify that byte appropriately, recalculate the checksum, fix that, reflash the chip in our programmer, desolder it, resolder it back into the PCM, reassemble it, reattach it to the car, hop in, turn the key, and see what happens. So, do you think it worked? Yeah. <laughs> it, this is all one attempt. I, I, I just think I know where the address is. This is all one attempt, so. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't work, of course. I was met with failure. Met with failure. <laughs> so why was this? Uh, who knows? There are a whole bunch of reasons why it didn't work. The most plausible explanations are that I just screwed it up. I just screwed up the, de the desoldering and resoldering. I mean, a flash chip's pins only have so many, they can only take so much abuse. You can only solder and desolder and resolder them so many times. Or to we discovered that the anti-theft status is returned via a non-standard scan tool request, which is why my Googling for a standard one didn't turn up any results. So that, since we know it's non-standard, that request might just do something different between the two versions. It, it probably doesn't bode well that I, the two firmwares were so different that I couldn't find any code patterns between the two of them. So that, that could be it. I mean, this Cavalier came out in 1997 when OBD2 was pretty much brand new, so it's entirely possible that the firmware in it is older than when GM thought to even put that request in the firmware. And then three, it's always possible I just screwed up the checksum calculation, who knows. <clears throat> so what do we do now? Give up, buy a new car. <laughs> you know, we, we did our best. Cheaper, yeah, did our best, what are you gonna do? <laughs> so, in conclusion, uh, if I hadn't bought a new car and could do it over again, I would study that firmware image I dumped and find out exactly how to reflash over OBD2. It, I think it's ridiculous that the knowledge of how to do that might only rest in the hands of a few people. We really need to crack that open. <laughs> but, so you know, if I did, we would have been, I would have been free to try reflashing over and over again until I was sure that I got it right. I mean, when you have to desolder and resolder a chip half a dozen times for one attempt, the potential for catastrophe is just really high. So. Uh, 
But anyway, if you take anything away from this, I hope you take away this. If, if you're faced with a problem and you want to solve it, and you come up with a really crazy thought, like riding an emulator for your car computer so you can disable the any theft status, <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to try it. You might be surprised, it just might actually work, and you might actually get something out of it. It might not have worked for me this time, but it has in the past more often than not. It's, the philosophy's worked for me pretty well. And we got a functioning car computer emulator out of it. <laughs> so I, I, may not have, it may not have, I may not have succeeded, but I did succeed in finding a way to get to the information that I wanted by creating that emulator, and that is a victory in itself. But anyway, if the idea seems crazy to you, or more importantly, if somebody's told you that your idea is crazy, then you definitely need to try it. Why? Because no one else is gonna try it. <laughs> Those types of niche projects where you know it can work, but everyone's telling you not to bother, that's your time to shine because one, you won't have any competition, and two, you might actually succeed, it might actually work. And another thing, if, if everyone's complaint about your idea is somebody will just do it a simpler way, so why bother? Well, I, I can just tell you, it's not about what you do, it's how you go about doing it. I mean, if you succeed, it doesn't matter if somebody beats you to it or knows more than you do. I, I mean, if nothing else, it gets you a speaking spot up here so, in front of you guys. So that makes it worth it. So thanks again for listening. Uh, if you want to contact me, my information's on the screen there or online. Uh, have a nice day. <laughs> also questions, if anybody has any. Lots and lots of Googling. Um, there is a PCM called a, an 0411 PCM, that, which that is, and I, don't, I couldn't find any evidence that that's what mine is, but it looks pretty darn similar. And when I started disassembling, I, actually I had to disassemble a whole bunch of different ones, just that one. But as I was looking, I started seeing the same um, I.O. ranges, the, like the, that one that controls that data link controller chip. When I start finding firmware that uses the, exactly the same addresses, it's probably the same circuit board or close to the same hardware. That and plus, I couldn't just I just couldn't get any closer to 1997 and 2001. <laughs> <So>. <clears throat> nope, I still have it actually. It's on my it's in this is in my graveyard of stuff, so I can come back to it someday. Uh, yeah. If you've ever looked at an emulator like for a game console, like a Sega Genesis emulator, there's all kind, it's really a mess. Every emulator, every, all the code for any emulator I've ever looked at is a mess. <laughs> it's always a mess. It, it, but it, it, always has to, it always has to have a processor core. It has to simulate all of the individual instructions. <clears throat> and then it also has to access, obviously it has to access RAM and external chip, external memory and that kind of thing. But it also has to access hardware that's unique or different to every device that, it, that it's in. So, you know, uh, the Sega Genesis, for example, has an, because it's a game system, it, there's obviously a lot of display processing, a lot of display hardware, display hardware and that kind of stuff in it. I don't care about any of that. So if I saw anything even closely related to that, I just ripped it out, deleted it. Because so, it's always more fun to delete code than to add it. So I just found something that did everything I thought I needed to do and more, and just rip it out. <laughs> so, and then you start fixing bugs from there. <laughs> so, it's a lot of trial and error. Other. Too much. <laughs> Probably months. <laughs> so. Um, yes. The I mentioned the being able to reflash the firmware over the OBD2 port. I really, it really, really bothers me that you have to go buy, you spend thousands of dollars just to buy a, a thing that does this. And just for GM cars, you can buy, you know, like for Subaru or for whatever, any other car. You've, there are much easier ways to do this. You can just build a little cable, solder it together, put it in there, and there you go. Hook it up to your computer, and there you go. But GM, you can't do that. And that's, I think that's ridiculous. We should be better about that. So if I were gonna revisit it, I would do that. I would, I would find a way to make that work. So that way I wouldn't, what's that? Is that a product? It, yeah, there are lots of products out there, but they all, they're all also really expensive. It, so it, it, this really should be free and open source, I think, so. <clears throat> Exactly. Yeah, they really. <laughs> no. I yeah. I a car is a car to me. I don't care. I mean, I'm a, I'm emotionally attached to this one, which is why I was trying so hard to fix it. But yeah, other than that, I just go get a car.
Anything else? Uh, in Tuner Pro, you, uh, you know, Tuner Pro is all about that. You, just, you specify an XDF file and a firmware image, and then it goes and makes the changes for you. So if you want to know what it's doing, just go make a change and see what it changed. You just do a diff between the binary file that generated versus the one I had originally, and when you do that, you see there are two things that changed. One is that flag, and two is a checksum. That plus a bunch of Googling about what other people do, you find there's all sorts of checksums. And no, no cryptographic signatures or anything like that. It's not protected in any way, because why would you need to do that, especially in 1997? But, uh, so. Is that it? Looks like it. All right. <laughs>